Advisory Board for the Jamaica Customs Agency. He also served as Registrar General for the Jamaica Ship Registry. A member of the Chartered Institute of Transport UK, Connecticut Maritime Association and American Association of Port Authorities. Dr. Deans has a solid history of environmental stewardship, including serving as a member of the IMO expert group on market-based measures to reduce ship emissions. Jamaican representative to the Mar Marine Environment Protection Committee of the IMO and former national coordinator for the wider Caribbean initiative on ship generated wastes. Dr. Dean is a Delaware PhD, having gained his terminal degree in marine policy on a full academic scholarship at the second oldest university in the USA, the University of Delaware. Delaware, only Harvard is older. I like that. Also a graduate of the University of Wales with a master of science degree in maritime studies as a Commonwealth scholar and the University of the West Indies with a BSc in chemistry. As a maritime policy expert, his skill set includes maritime economics, maritime and admiralty law, environmental economics, and co commercial aspects of ports and shipping management. Professor Deans is an associate professor in logistics and supply chain sustainability at the Car Caribbean Maritime University and serves as executive director of the CMU's Center for Sustainable Supply Chains and as a member of the academic board. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the Jamaica Special Economic Zone Authority. Welcome, Dr. Deans. Before, just one matter before we start, everyone is on mute. So if there are any questions, please type them into, a, into the chat and I will present them during the Q&A session after Dr. Dean speaks. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I, I can't see you while I have my presentation up. So I'll just ask, uh, if, you're, if you're not hearing me, can somebody please advise me? So this presentation is geared towards demystifying the special economic zone regime. Uh, I have been asked by the chamber to speak about some general concepts around the SEZ. So my co-presenter, Ms. Chantal Bennett, one of our former employees, and I will be simplifying the various roles under the SEZ Act and regulations that create opportunities for developers, occupants, and zone users. We will seek to provide tips to expedite the application process and what the authority does to facilitate business here in Jamaica. And we will seek to provide a better understanding of the eligible and excluded activities. We will mention some of the priority industries and other development guidelines that emphasize economic, social, and environmental sustainability. I will ask that you pay particular attention to the pictures that we have in the slides. They show existing zones so that you can get a feel of the extent of the activities taking place within the SEZ space. So, What's the mission of the authority? Why do we exist? We are primarily a regulatory body. And if you look at the preamble of the SEZ Act, it states that the purpose of the act is to make provisions for the development, regulation, construction, supervision, management, and control of special economic zones in Jamaica. So we have a very focused mandate and it's one that is very strategic to the development of Jamaica. I will start off with an in, giving you some background information as to why we were set up and how we were, are set up. So the act came into force in, in 2016 and it repealed the previous Free Zone Act. And as such, it mandated us to enhance the Jamaican economy 
to promote measures, actions, and invest in investments, improving the logistics change which zones are part. And you'll hear me speak about logistics quite a lot. We foster the development and expansion in zones in collaboration with the government, international organization, and more and importantly, the private sector. The point being that we do we currently do not build or operate zones. We are primarily a regulator and we work with the private sector to develop zones. In developing the zones, we, we ensure that we protect the environment and we enable the persons conducting in the zones to compete effectively. And very importantly, we also promote technical and operational education and training in the, in the zone to ensure that we extract long-term benefits from operating these zones. Now, Jamaica, like most small island development states, we are affected by climate change and are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of climate-related events and natural disasters. We saw that last year with the flood rains that we had that caused tremendous damage. What the country needs at this time of COVID-19. Excuse me, Dr. Deans. Hello. Your presentation is not up. You're not seeing it? No, we are not seeing your presentation at this time. Okay. One second, let me try to correct that. That's excellent. We're seeing it right now. Perfect. Thank you very much.
Do Dr. Deans, we can't hear you right now. We can see your screen, but we can't hear you right at, right at this moment. It appears that Dr. Deans is on mute. I did just try to call him. Um, Dr. Deans? Dr. Deans? Yep, oh, we, perfect. We Hello? can see now, oh, can and we can hear you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Um, okay. Now you have your presentation. Sure how far you heard. Okay, we heard until you, when you put up the slides. Hello? Hello, Dr. Deans, when you put up the slides, after that, we lost your audio. So if you just go back to this slide, I think that would be a great place to, to go back to, if that would be okay. All right, go back to the beginning of the slides. No, the, where you were when, when you put the slides up. Wow, yeah. so you missed all that I was saying? Since you put the slides up, yes. All right, let's start from here. This looks perfect. Okay, so you didn't catch all of that. Wow, I was talking to myself. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, um, my apologies. Um, we have these, this new COVID, this new COVID um, environment has forced us to adapt new technologies, which sometimes pose challenges. Okay, so let me start over. So I'm gonna give you a quick rundown on the regime, looking on the role of developers and provide a, a wider understanding on the SEZ regime. Now the mission of the authority is based on the SEZ Act. We are a regulatory body. And as such, we currently do not build or operate zones. We're primary operate as a regulator. And the Act basically states, makes provisions for the development, regulation, construction, supervision, management, and control of special economic zones in Jamaica. Now we were established in 2016 and our basic mandate is to enhance the Jamaican economy, promote measures and actions and investments aimed at the logistic change of which zones are a part. We foster development of expansion of zones in collaboration with other government agencies, international organizations and the private sector. We ensure that we protect the environment as a, in, in the course of development and operation of these zones. We enable persons conducting business in the zones to compete effectively in the conduct of their business. And we promote technical and operational education and training in zone development. Now Jamaica, like most small island developing states, we face the effects of climate change due to its high vulnerability to climate related events and natural disasters. We're also impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic and that has triggered, you know, a deep economic rec recession across the globe. So at this time, what we need is a unified vision of sustainable development that is inclusive and resilient. In order to achieve the objective of sustainable economic growth, the authority is ensuring that a cohesive approach is taken to the expansion of existing zones and the development of new zones. We have seen across the globe that a well-structured specific economic zone regime can trigger, can be an effective economic stimulus. And we have seen this in China, in Singapore, in UAE, in India, Costa Rica, Panama, etc. 
Now, the fiscal incentives available under our regime are the most attractive and competitive investment support mechanism offered to investment investors in goods production and services. Let me repeat that. The fiscal incentives available under Jamaica's economic zone regime are the most attractive and competitive investment support mechanism offered by the government to investors in goods production and distribution and service provision. And as such, we have seen several first movers across a wide range of industry take advantage of this program to, to develop strategically located special economic zones. And these have begun to stimulate the economy. By design, these zones are spawning industrial clusters that are providing employment, commercial, residential training and rec recreational opportunities while also generating foreign exchange um, technology and knowledge transfer. Now, this initiative is, you would have heard a lot about the Logistics Hub Initiative. And the Logistics Hub Initiative seeks to, seeks to um, have Jamaica inserted into global supply and value chains and provide an effective framework where companies can operate in Jamaica and serve a global market. The Logistics Hub Initiative has as essential component the development of special economic zones where these international companies would be based. So as such, the, LA, the Logistics Hub Initiative incorporates development or expansion of key supporting infrastructure, um, such as ports, airports, and other transport mechanisms which support the special economic zone. Now the World Bank gave us a lot of support in developing the logistics of initiative, preparing the, the master plan for, for the LHI. And as such, we are effectively rolling out that initiative as we speak. And the establishment of the Special Economic Zone Authority was a very important component of that master plan. When the act came into force, it effectively modernized the previous free zone regime. This was established by putting in place state-of-the-art competitive regulations which are under constant review to ensure that they remain current with global best practice. The robust legal and regulatory regime for SEZs represents, let me repeat again, the most attractive fiscal incentive scheme the country has on offer. Now, the authority inherited a free zone portfolio of approximately 180 three free zone entities. And these are spread across 10 parishes. The free zone entities included 20 firms with promoter status. Promoters are what we call developers now. And these include the well-known zones like Kingston Free Zone, Monte Gabriel Free Zone, Barnet Tech Park, Casamar, etc. Nearly all the free, most of the zones are located in three primary areas, Kingston, Montego Bay, and St. Catherine. Currently the zones provide employment for about 65,000 people. Our free zones range from as little as 2,000 square feet to up to 10 million square feet in certain specialized zones. Overall, the free zones or special economic zones occupy about 16.5 million square feet and include commercial office space, training and incubation space, warehousing and distribution, 
manufacturing, assembly, and production facilities, among others. But what we have recognized that due to a limited supply of purpose-built purpose -built multi-user industrial and commercial zones, the private sector has been constrained to establish many small standalone facilities located across the country. And we have seen these primarily set up to meet the needs of the, the BPO operators in particular. So what's the vision of the authority? Where are we headed? As we said, the SEZ regime is an integral part of the logistics of the initiative, which seeks to make Jamaica the global logistics gateway interconnecting the Americas to the world. Now the development of the logistics hub initiative is a microcosm of the global trends of production fragmentation and offshoring. And it is a multifaceted program for large industrial upgrading geared to strengthen the competitive of local firms and linking them to global value chains. And especially we seek to attract foreign firms to establish operations within Jamaica. Now, as I mentioned, this is a part of a continuing trend of production fragmentation, which takes place across the world. It is the intention of the authority to exploit these trends, which are amplified by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we not only see the the COVID-19 pandemic as a threat, we also see it as opportunity, we also see opportunities emanating and we can discuss that further. Now, what are our responsibilities? Our responsibilities extend to existing zones, pipeline zones, zones which are in the works and ensuring that the SCZ framework is constantly being upgraded and modified to meet with, with trend, global trends. So when we look at our, our primary roles, I want to emphasize that as a regulator, we work our primary, our primary stakeholders are our developers. It is the developers who make the substantial investments in physical, and, and soft infrastructure to build and operate these zones. And we pay special attention to cementing our relationship with developers and their occupants or tenants. We have also, we'll be launching a program called Sustainability. Now, sustainability is a, a term which I'll speak about later. And that will seek to make the zones more sustainable and uh, meet the requirements of the average man on the street. Now, in terms of pipeline economic zones, you would have heard of the Cayman a Special Economic Zone, which is a flagship project. You will hear more about projects like Pandora, which is an iconic pharmaceutical cluster, Xanadu, SEZ, which is an iconic creative and film cluster, and Inverness, which is also another light industrial cluster. And, I, and there are several private zones which are currently being rolled out and in the pipeline, which you'll hear about in the upcoming weeks, you know, like Grand Ridge, Ten Palm Studios, um, Port Authority, Port Centric Logistics, and Biopris Knowledge Parks um, in in St. James. Now this map shows the spread of zones across the country. The red dots show developers, the green dots, the red dots show single entity developers, the green dots are multi, multi occupancy developers and the blue dots are occupants. The next set of slides just show 
some of the statistics around the zones. Um, we're currently income in the, for the authority. We, are, we currently earn income that covers our expenditure. You know, so we're, we're self-sustaining at the moment. We have a total of 132 entities made up of developers and occupants. And in terms of employment, you can see there's a, a rising trend in terms of the growth of employment within the zones. In terms of investments um, over the years, we have been attracting quite a, a lot of investments. Um, in 2020, we had over $475 million in investments. And these investments are broken down into several industrial clusters, automotive, BPO, distribution, manufacturing, medical and um, nutraceutical among others. Again, this graph shows um, the year on year investments in the various um, sectors. In terms of imports, uh, $17 billion worth of imports in 2018. Um, I'll just quickly go through these. In terms of exports, in 2019, uh, much lower than imports, $7, million, $7 billion in, in exports in 2019 and $4.6 billion in 2020. We have a lot of work to go in terms of growing our exports and there's tremendous opportunities for that. Yes, this shows the investment um, about, we have about 660 million of uh, investment projects in US in the pipeline um, currently being processed. And as I mentioned, about 65,000 65, um, persons are employed in the sector. Now, in terms of strategic objectives for, in our strategic plan, we aim to increase the financial strength of the regime and the authority. We want to, increase the attraction of investments and market share within Jamaica. We want to enhance our operational ex excellence. We want to develop a strong belief in sustainability. And we want to improve our communications with our customers and stakeholders to improve customer satisfaction. Now you would have seen, I'm not, you would have seen in recent headlines, um, US 1 billion for Caymanas. This was an interview with Ambassador Tapia on the outgoing ambassador to the US. Uh, you know, he has been working very closely to encourage US investors to invest in Jamaica. Um, You'd have seen the headline about new investment through SEZ regime projected to exceed 3.1 billion you know, over the next couple of years. That was the, the, the budget presentation by Minister Vaz last, last year. Um, the PM also spoke about targeting two special, large scale special economic zone within um, the next three years. You know, mounting global awards, uh, which were highlighted in the Gleena. You would have also heard about Jamaica winning the bid to host the World Free Zone Association International Conference and Exhibition in, in 2021. And I'll speak more about that later. And uh, the British High Commissioner speaking about the logistics hub being able to generate high growth levels for Jamaica. So you can see that on the international scale and within government and the diplomatic circles, 
that there are tremendous interests in the what is taking place in the SEZ regime. Now, the, the Cayman, a special economic zone, which we will be having a developers conference later this year, uh, is a priority project. And we co have completed the feasibility study on this large scale project, and you'll be hearing much more about this. Now, this project will conform to the UN's SDG goal number 11, which aims to make you know, cities, communities, and human set settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. Now, they have been asked to look at what industries do we seek to attract within. So the next couple of slides will look at that. Now, the SEZ regime or, and the previous free zone regime were primarily set up to attract goods producing industries. The regime that has set up creates uh, tax and customs incentives that are primary, that are very attractive to goods producing, but also to service industries. So our main target industries coming from the logistics of master plan are in a range of clusters where Jamaica has some comparative advantage in. So things like electrical and appliance manufacturing, you know, basically like assembly type activities, pharmaceutical and biomedical, transport and logistics, creative industries. And we know about um, the internet enabled services, you know, such as BPO and so on. They're also supporting industry clusters such as education and knowledge, energy, um, business and financial services, chemicals, and agribusiness and food processing. And these, the next two slides show the, the priority areas, which are automotive, pharmaceutical, creative, global services, logistics and supply, food manufacturing, electronic and digital and ICT. So some of the major projects that um, are on the horizon are currently in the pipeline. You'd have seen you know, construction taking place across the country. This, this picture is of um, Portmore Holdings, um, new project in, in Portmore. As part of the work that we do, we put a lot of emphasis on creating the framework. As I mentioned, we are a regulator and our business development philosophy establishes unique selling points relative to each industrial cluster, which we have defined on the basis of the strengths, the composite structure and specialization of the anchor companies in those zones. The underlying rationale of the SEZ regime is based on the fact that consumers respond positively to discounts and incentives. Because as, as you know, the SEZ regime is essentially a preferential tax regime. But the regime is enhanced by ensuring that you have certain capabilities associated with it. So you would see us working in putting in place other supporting mechanisms. We are currently developing our corporate campus. We have programs that we're working with HART and the UK High Commission to develop um, the workforce capacity. We are um, constantly doing a review of the SEZ Act and regulations to ensure that the regime remains current and state of the art. We are working on aspects of rules of origin and the overall development framework for special economic zones to ensure that they are sustainable. So this is a slide of some of the zones. And as you know, Kingston Wharves and uh, Kingston Freeport Terminals are, are special economic zones. Although I'm aware that some people are not aware of that. But they are our two largest zones. Uh, 
Um, the Western terminal zones is moving uh, into automobile transshipment in a big way. And we wanna move up the value chain to involve other aspects in the automotive sector, including customization and other activities that can take place within the automobile sector. This includes um, some assembly and specialization of particular commercial vehicles. An important part of what we do is business facilitation. And we have, we have working what we call a business acceleration center or what you know as a business one-stop shop. So we work very closely with firms to get them operational quickly to support the expansion of existing zones to help companies navigate the regulatory uh, minefield. We engage with business executives and workers within the community to encourage backward linkages. And we operate a range of support services along with other MDAs. And we work with customers to generate new opportunities within the SEZ space. We're particularly proud of our workforce development program. We currently have an MOU with HART and we're working very closely with the UK High Commission through the Department of Trade and Industry to develop a technical and voc vocational training capabilities for the existing and new industries coming within this. So you will see a rollout of programs including apprentice internship, permanent um, job and job experience, support and ensure that the skills available to support this zone development. Now, sustainability is a concept that we are, and we are to make a unique fusion, conceptivity, where, you know, in what we do, we, we want to ensure that the person is, is healthy, both physically, emotionally, in their workplace, that we're not harming the environment, and we believe that we can infuse a very unique concept in the development of our zones to Jamaica. Now, you would have heard that we were awarded the bid to host the World Free Zone Organization Annual Conference in Jamaica in June 2021. Now, that conference would host 1,500 delegates um, from across 135 countries. And these zones are responsible for about 3,500 zones across the world. And free zones and special economic zones are responsible for about 30% of global trade passes through these zones. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we may have to make some adjustments to do that schedule. And I think we may have to look at um, postponing the, the conference too, but we will continue to work assiduously to ensure that um, we have it um, hopefully um, a couple months later than we had scheduled. So in terms of our ex expectations for this year, we intend to become ISO certified. We're looking for a high loans, greater recognition of the SEB, SEZ's contribution to the economy. We want to work closer with our developers. We intend to establish stronger global. We will be implementing in several projects, we will be creating a common database. We will seek begin work on our corporate com campus, launch our workforce development program, and ensure robust SEZ amendments. So, in closing, I just will be showing some pictures of some of the existing zones. This is Casamar in Montego Bay. 
this is Happy Sandy Bay Collective Solutions. I think they do a lot of work for Amazon out in um, Hanover. This is Port Moore Informatics Park. Uh, another uh, new development. And then one of our, this is me and one of our other processing zones that um, produce some very fine products in our medical cannabis. So with that, I thank you. And um, I will hand over to the host and um, uh, we can take some questions and answers. Thank you so much, Dr. Deans. That was um, a lot of information in a very short period of time. And um, clearly some of those um, incredible investment figures are things that people you know, want to, definitely I'm sure our membership would like to be part of. Um, so I have a couple of questions here uh, because I know that under the rules, you know, people are wondering, you know, can my business be part of an SEZ? Is the area that I work in something that can become part of an SEZ? Um, and I, I guess I have a question about the exemptions. So there's one from Sandra here and I'll put it in two parts. She's saying, why are financial services excluded from the zone? But then I realized that she's asking also, um, can I conduct financial outsourcing services for a financial company located abroad? The company is not based here, but they farm out some of their work to Jamaica. So I'm assuming that some of that uh, is about whether you're actually conducting financial services or whether you're conducting the back office of financial services. So let me pose that question to you. How, wh why is financial services and maybe insurance excluded? And how do you differentiate between offering services for those companies abroad versus here in Jamaica? Okay, excellent question. Now, the excluded list of companies under the SEZ regime was to ensure that there was not any duplication in benefits. As I mentioned, the SEZ regime is a preferential tax regime. And one of the things the framers wanted to ensure was that the existing tax arrangements were not disrupted when the SEZ regime came into place. So you will see many of the entities that are excluded they have either separate um, incentive schemes or they have special tax regimes already in place. So you will see like Boxsite, which has a special incentive regime, not getting benefits. Financial services and insurance, which have um, a different tax arrangements, um, those are excluded. Um, other activities like that. But I wanna make a very important point. When we say excluded, it means they are excluded from availing themselves of SEZ benefits, but those entities could be located in a special economic, a large scale special economics, for example, you would need to have banks or retail companies to serve the customers and, and clients in such a zone. So they could be physically located, but they could not get the SEZ benefits in terms of tax benefits and so on. Okay. So when you're talking about building a large scale structured zone, yes, you of the size of Caymanas, yes, you would have to have financial institutions, hotels and things located in that zone, but they would not get the SEZ benefits, but they could be zone users. Right, so from, Correct me if I'm wrong. I hope that answers the question. All right, correct. There are other questions about exemptions here. So I guess this is a bit of a theme. So if you are a BNS or a GMMB or an NCB or a locally based financial services company or a remittance company, whatever it, it is, and you want to locate inside a special economic zone in order to provide commerce to the um, the workers in that zone, 
You can locate in the zone, but you will not receive the tax benefits of special economic zone status. Correct. If you are providing, Correct. Correct. right, if you are providing financial services, back office services to a foreign company that is conducting financial services, you would qualify for the tax benefits. Correct? Yes, we currently have companies who are providing those services, who are getting tax, because they're providing a service. They're providing right. outsourcing service. Okay. So, you know, whatever that service is, is different from um, being a bank getting under the, the um, Financial Services Act. Yeah. So we have other questions about the exemptions. So I'll start with this question, although it's not in there because it, it leads on to something else. If you are a startup company and you have a brilliant new brainchild idea that you're going, that is going to like take over the world and you know, you're, you're starting up as, as long as you're not in the exemptions, you could start up as an occupier in the zone, correct? Well, yes. If you are a brand new entity, um, yes, you can start up within the zone, provided you are not an ex excluded activity. All right. So one of the gentlemen here is asking, and you know, given the environmental, um, you know, priorities that the the country needs to undertake. Um, as operators of scrap recycling and waste to the energy businesses, are these considered for inclusion? And if they are, for Jamaica, would, would, do you think the government would you know, start to think about including companies like that that are providing these sorts of green services uh, within the special economic zone um, area? So. So that relates to recycling. The question is in the so, chat. So it says our operations. Yeah, recycling is, is not is. Yeah, recycling is not excluded. It's it just has to ensure that within a particular zone, it does what. So, for example, you wouldn't want. Uh, say a, a garbage recycling company beside a pharmaceutical company. So it, it is left to the actual developer. What are the activities that takes place? But recycling is not excluded. It's something that's permitted within the zone. Okay, so that's, that's excellent. That's a good understanding. Um, all right, I have two more. Um, all right, first one. Um, as I'm, I'm reading this out, but I'm going to add to it. As I understand, the Port Authority Informatics Park in, Park in Portmore has not had much take up despite the rapid growth of the BPO sector. What are the takeaways from this for the SEZA? But I'd also like to ask, what are the takeaways from, you know, what? Where is the balance between encouraging private sector developers to develop space when the government is competing with them as well and able to um, have maybe a, an advantage in terms of competing for occupants? So there's two questions in there. What I guess oh, it's, so, what's going on in Yes, Port? I noticed, and that's a very Sorry, uh, maybe so, that's a very <laughs> difficult question. Sorry, that's a very difficult question, Melanie. So, but I will answer it with my government hat on, and I'll answer it uh, <laughs> my own opinion. Right now, so the government policy has always been to encourage the private sector to lead in terms of the provision of space, but what? what has happened in the past is where um, the private sector is either not moving or not moving fast enough. Um, the government has um, put in place certain types of infrastructure. And you saw that 
even with the free zone regime, it was a government was the first one to start building out um, free zone space. But the overall policy of the government is that the private sector is the one who should take the lead at all times. Now, um, what we have also want to encourage is that there be diversification. Because what we have also seen is that once an activity proves to be attractive, everybody seems to, to go along and follow in that path. But the, a building that can serve for, um, say, a, a call center can also serve other purposes. So, you know, we encourage developers and investors to look at a wide range of activities and not limit themselves to a few industries. Um, so my, my personal view is that the private sector should take the lead in terms of, because that they, they, they understand the businesses of being a developer and also they understand the operations of, of, of particular industries. That is not something that government should be um, involved in. So, you know, my view is that, you know, it's something that the private sector should lead on um, aggressively. All right, so, and, and just to be clear, um, I don't think we'd have reached where we are if the Port Authority hadn't taken the lead at the start. Of it. Because if, if, they, if, if they hadn't taken it up and, you know, shown us that um, this was an area that um, was a good opportunity, then maybe we might not have all seen it. Now there's a, yes. lot, a lot of questions on work from home. And I know this is mm -hmm. a sensitive issue. Uh, when COVID started, um, it was, um, I think, I mean, the BPIAJ did an incredible job working with the SEZ and the government in terms of immediately setting up some form of work from, from home regime where 35,000 people were almost immediately able to work from home. So there are two questions. What, uh, what about the work from home regime and including it into the SEZ Act? Are there any plans for that? And the other question I have as well, these are from the chat. How is the SEZ assisting in creating a long-term sustainable and viable solution for work from home? Work at home is the new global way forward. So how is the SEZ supporting this? Okay, so let me answer that two ways. Um, based on the COVID-19 pandemic, work from home is an essential um, part of commerce in the future, whether in all business spheres. It's something that we support wholeheartedly and even at the authority. I mean, um, the vast majority of our staff works from home to ensure you know, their, their, their safety. But we have to understand what the SEZ regime is. The SEZ regime demarcates a specific geographical area to be a special economic zone. And entities within that zone get their tax benefits. We do not have any jurisdiction for what takes place outside the zone. So you would have seen all the um, work from home um, allowances that have been given to special entities that are in the SEZ space. It's being given by the Ministry of Finance because we do not regulate activities outside the zone. So the authority has no jurisdiction over what takes place. So we could not in any way regulate or oversee what takes place in um, 35,000 homes across the country. It's just not within our remit. So um, to try and, and um, incorporate it in the act, the SEZ Act is not the right place. That is why it's, a, it's the customs and the Ministry of Finance who are ensuring and who are the ones who authorize the work from home arrangements. 
Well, um, Dr. Deans, actually, this the Chamber of Commerce itself has a, a position on taxation of digital devices. Um, and if the government was to take that on and remove the tax from the computers and tablets and those items, um, then we do also believe that that may go some way to solve this problem also. Um, yes. so, but that's the position of the chamber, is it fixes no, no, two issues that... in one go. It, it gets away of the duty regime on key items that are going to drive growth. So it fixes your problem, fixes the work from home problem, well, and then fixes an no, educational but... problem same time. It's like, you know, a triple whammy. I so. think we're on the same page because what we have constantly said is that we support the removal of taxes from um, digital items. We and the authorities support that because we, we think it's counterproductive um, the way it is structured. But if you look at the SEZ Act, anything related to tax is the purview of the Ministry of Finance. We cannot, we don't get involved in what tax applies or do not apply. So right. when you speak of government, you have to separate what the authority is responsible for and what the rest of um, the Ministry of Finance is responsible for. So we, sub our position is that, you know, we believe that the removal of um, these duties on, on, on things like computers are counterproductive, but it's not our call to, to remove them. Yes, it, it sits with the Ministry of Finance. Okay, yes. so um, in terms of um, providing, before we move on, I think I've covered nearly all of the, the questions. Um, I mean, is there, um, wait, one, someone just sent another message. Oh, um, well, someone is asking how, if we have a robust work from home regime, what's gonna happen to the developers? Um, so. That's a good question. And um, a lot of people don't take that into account and we have to take that into account. So when uh, we have seen when the, work from home arrangements came into place. We visited one particular developer and 95% of the staff within the zone was working from home. And then what ended up happening was that the, the tenant started to ask for reduction in rent or reduction in space. So when you have somebody who has invested in this physical uh, infrastructure, you also have to protect that investment. Yeah. So you have to bear that in mind when you look at um, putting in place these provisions. Yeah, and I think the provision you've put in place is that a certain number of people have to work within the zone um, in order for work. Yes, you have to have, yeah, you have to have a certain percentage. And I think um, it has to be upwards of 50% right. um, remaining in the zone. Yeah. So Angela, that, that, that would be the, that's the, the protection for, for the developers. Um, um, Dr. Deans, after this, can we get, um, for all of the participants, can we get, um, you know, a, an email with links to the fiscal incentives, to the application form? I'd just like to say that um, JAMPRO and the DBJ work very closely with the SEZ. Um, Right. Yeah. I mean, would you like to comment on financing opportunities for, I mean, it's not the purview of the SEZ, but it, it's something you, you know, that you're connected with. Yeah. Um, on your first point, we have a, a brand new website, um, www.jcesar.com. You can find all the application forms, all the incentives, um, all the information that you need. And um, you can also call the authority. I mean, anybody's interested in. Oh, he's frozen. I hope he unfreezes in a second. Program. I mentioned that I'd be happy to assist anybody in um, their, their, their application. Um, what was your other, the other part of your question? Um, Financing. Did you answer that? Oh, financing, yeah. So we also, it, 
yeah, we also work very closely with the Bankers Association and the um, legal fraternity, um, keeping them abreast of um, what the incentives are because um, there are tremendous opportunities for the financial sector. And what we have seen, there's no shortage of funds available to assist with SEZ projects, whether from the commercial banks, the pension funds, insurance funds, um, there's quite a, a bit of financing available for SEZ projects. And just to confirm, that goes for BPO and logistics. Could, um... Every manufacturing, everything, um, all, okay. all sectors. Okay, perfect. Well, Dr. Deans, I think that you gave us a, a huge amount of information. I would just also, um, I would just also like to say that the, the website is very easy to use. And also if you call, I know from experience that um, the, the people at Jay Cesa are extremely helpful in explaining things um, and we'll go over everything with you uh, very much. And um, they take that job very seriously. So I, I, that's my experience. Um, so, um, so thank you very much, Dr. Deans. I really appreciate it and, and it was an excellent presentation. Um, in terms of moving on to the, the law, Dr. Deans, you may have to just give Chantal your co-host status so that she can, she can present and unmute herself. Um, and just while you're doing that, let me introduce Chantal Bennett. Uh, Chantal Bennett is an attorney at law who practices civil and commercial litigation at the law firm Duncox. Her areas of focus include regulatory advice on special economic zones and other fiscal incentives, employment law, maritime law, and contractual disputes. Previously, previously she worked in the public sector as a corporate secretary, head of the legal unit of the regulator of special economic zones, and at the attorney general's chambers in its international law division. Prior to practicing law in Jamaica, Chantal received training in the area of international law and arbitration at the international law firm Dermot, Will and Emery and at the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea. Through Chantal's professional and educational experience, she has developed knowledge in corporate governance, international law and commercial law. Chantal holds a Bachelor of Science in International Relations and Politics, Bachelor of Laws and a Certificate of Legal Education. She is currently pursuing a master's of law and tutor students at the University of the West Indies. Her passion for community development and a strong belief in democracy has led her to become a director of the Kiwanis Young Professionals Jamaica Kingston and a commissioner of the Jamaica Debates Commission. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Chantal, who I now see as co-host. So she should be able to get her, um, her, her presentation up. Um, so brilliant. Well done. I will now mute myself. Thank you very much. Morning, everyone. Thank you, Melanie. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you all for joining. So Dr. Deans would have spoken about the Special Economic Zone Authority and answered some of the critical questions that you have. Today, I will be focusing on navigating the Special Economic Zone regime considerations for applying to the special to become a special economic zone entity what are the opportunities for SEZ entities whether or not you want to be a zone user occupant or developer the obligations and rights of those entities and what happens after you become an SEZ entity so some of the questions you will have asked I think are very relevant so let's start off with the significance of the SEZ regime Melanie would have spoken about the fiscal incentives which are available on the website of the SEZ Authority, as well as the website of Jampro. So just briefly to go through them, and I'm, I'm sure you'd be aware of some of them. So we have customs relief from, customs duty relief on goods, income tax relief, and income tax relief operates in such a way for a developer who is do doing rental activities, the, in the rate of income tax is at 0%. There is also GCT relief and GCT applies to electricity, telephone, and also supplies from the domestic territory to a zone. 
stamp duty relief. This is not one of the popular ones, but it's one to look at if you're involved in activities dealing with land. So that is if you're a developer purchasing or selling or leasing land. There is also transfer tax relief, which is applicable to a developer. And there is also consideration of exclusion from other relief. So it's important to note that you can access incentives under the SEZ Act, and you can also access incentives such as product input relief but you cannot access incentives such as under the Urban Renewal Act or any incentives in relation to bauxite or mining. So moving forward to the opportunities for growth, apart from the fiscal incentives, it's important to consider the non-fiscal incentives and ways in which by joining an SEZ, you create linkages and you can increase trade in Jamaica and throughout the Caribbean and internationally. Earlier, Dr. Dean spoke about the boss and what we call the Business Acceleration Center. This allows you, if you're an SEZ entity or even applying for SEZ status and you need a building permit or a planning permit, a fire permit, or even an environmental permit, there's an entity at the authority that assists you with applying to the regulator authority. And we know in Jamaica, sometimes things take a little longer than normal. This um, Business Acceleration Center boss assist you with getting the re relevant permits that you need in a shorter space of time. Other things to consider that are that zones allow suppliers or service providers to be more closely connected. So let's give an example. Suppose you're a manufacturer of a phone and you need the parts for the, the phone and you operate within a zone. There might be another company within the zone that has the parts. So this would reduce the cost that you would incur if that company was in China or in another zone or outside of the zone. Other things to consider is that by operating in a zone, it, like, it allows you to become more integrated in the global, global supply chain through the creation of backward and forward linkages, which Dr. Deans would have spoken about earlier. In addition to that, by being a special economic zone entity, it allows you to delay certain business costs. So for example, if you're operating in what we call the domestic territory, you would have had to immediately pay customs duty on goods which are imported. However, if you operate in a zone, for example, you import a car, you don't have to immediately pay the customs duty on the motor vehicle until the motor vehicle comes out of the zone and goes into whatever um, automobile shop for example, that might be selling the car. That's an example. So in addition to those points, you can also have the opportunity of creating a new business and using the digital economy. You'll find through this presentation, we'll speak a little bit about COVID and how things have changed and the relevance of the digital economy. So that covers the different opportunities for, opportunities for growth. And we'll move on to opportunities for becoming an SEZ entity. So Dr. Deans would have gone into this earlier. What I decided to speak about was zone users to begin with. And the importance with zone users, and Melanie also brought it up. So if you're a KFC, if you're an NCB, or if you're just providing a service, even a coconut man, you can become a zone user. Zone, the, there are a list of activities which are excluded for developers. And earlier, somebody mentioned finance. It's important to note that for financial services that are excluded, it is financial services that are regulated by the Bank of Jamaica or the Financial Services Commission. So if you're doing some other form of financial services, those are not excluded. However, um, if you're doing financial services that are regulated by the Bank of Jamaica, then you could become a zone user. A lot of persons, when looking at SEZ, they don't look at the opportunity of being a zone user. But when you think about it, if SEZs develop to the extent that they are in China, in Jamaica, then if you have a KFC or if you have a bank in a zone, that entity will have immediate access to a number of other companies and be able to build and have economic growth. Other thing to consider is that um, zone users do not have access to fiscal incentives except the um, stamp duty incentive but they also have access to non-fiscal incentives. So earlier when we spoke about the business acceleration center and assistance that you may get with an environmental permit, a zone user can access that. Now, occupants. 
and occupants is a limited liability company and it's important to understand that under the SEC regime, occupants have to be incorporated in, in Jamaica. This is different from the free zone regime which has overseas companies. This occupant signs what we call a sub-concession agreement with the developer. An occupant is basically a tenant and the developer is the landlord. Occupants are eligible for both fiscal and non-fiscal incentives. I would have spoken about the fiscal incentives earlier. And later on in the presentation, I'll go a little bit more into the eligibility criteria for an occupant. Examples of occupants in Jamaica include a number of business process outsourcing companies, distribution companies, and auto part companies. Dr. Deans would have shown pictures of the various zones. And when you go on the website of the Special Economic Zone Authority, you can see a list of companies there. So, as, um, as you're listening, if you have a business now and you want to join a zone, then you could become a zone user. If you have an idea for a new business you want to form, then you could consider becoming an occupant. Occupants are not allowed to conduct a business that is an excluded activity. And we would have gone into the excluded activities earlier, which include tourism services, retail trade, catering services, and mining. Now, there is an area that is not so popular, and it's called micro, small, and medium enterprise occupants. So there is room for these type of occupants under the special economic zone regime. To my knowledge, there doesn't currently exist that MSME occupant, but Dr. Deans can speak more to that. This occupant, the eligibility criteria for this occupant is not as stringent as it would have been for a regular occupant, However, within the first year of op operation, this occupant has to show that they would have invested at least US 25,000 in equipment and machinery. So I'll go into this a little bit later in the presentation. Now, developers, who or what is a developer? A developer is also a limited liability company that again is incorporated in Jamaica and is established by what we call a sponsor. A sponsor is basically the entity that puts up the capital for the developer. So the shareholders and this developer can enter into either a master concession agreement or a license agreement. Now the master concession agreement is if the land on which the SEZ is being developed belongs to the government, while the license agreement is if the, the land is privately owned. Examples of Jamaica of developers in Jamaica, Dr. Deans would have shown um, Caribbean Resource Limited, Kingston Works Limited, Kingston Freeport Terminal, and the various um, zones operated by Port Authority of Jamaica. So they range from logistic companies, manufacturing companies, agro-processing, etc. Now you have different types of developers. We have what we call one, a multi-purpose developer, and two, a single entity developer. Single entity developers are those, those developers that operate as the landlord, and operate a business at the same time. So you have a number of BPOs that are single entity developers because they're basically the developer and the occupant at the same time. Multi-purpose developers are developers who solely do developer work, which is rental activities. So for example, they develop and manage this zone and rent it out to occupants. Now we have various types of zones and the intention is Jamaica is supposed to expand into these type of zones what you have are generalized zones and specialized zones the difference is that specialized zones are like maritime zones or aviation zones but to my knowledge there's a specialized zone which exists near the port now and it's hoped that we'll have more spe specialized zones particularly aviation we have Burnham Steel we have out by the airport etc no we have zone users, occupants, and developers, but what are their obligations and what are their rights? You find that a lot of persons or a lot of entities will enter the special economic zone regime. They'll sign an agreement, but they're not sure what their obligations are. And the difficulties with this is you might do something which is contrary to the SEZ Act or regulations, and you don't know, but you should have known. So first we'll be start with zone users. The trick with zone users is that the regulations don't have in detail what their rights and obligations are. But there's a specific regulation, Regulation 41, that briefly outlines how you apply to be a zone user. In addition, when you apply to be a zone user, you're given an authorization letter by the authority, which, which outlines your rights and obligations. So things to consider are, for example, if you're involved in a, an activity that is related to excise, you should have logistical and security arrangements, particularly if it's retail trade. And this is essentially just to protect um, 
protect things in relation to custom and, and ensure there is not leakage outside the zone. Other things to consider is that the zone user, as mentioned, doesn't have entitlement to fiscal incentives with the exception of stamp duty. And there's also um, a basis for termination of the authorization if the zone user acts contrary to the SDZ Act or regulation. So it's important if you're a zone user, just to look at your authorization letter, ensure you understand what your rights and obligations are, and also to ask questions of the authority. You don't have to just take the authorization and say that's it. It's important for you to understand what is it saying. So now we have occupants. What are their rights and obligations? As indicated before, they're not to be in, they're not to be involved in excluded activities. In a nutshell, an occupant can employ persons in Jamaica or overseas. And in Jamaica, we have a number of foreign investors and they would employ foreign nationals. The occupant can transfer funds in and outside of Jamaica. They can transfer assets and lands, and they can, of course, conduct their business activity, which is the reason why they're an occupant. It's important to note that in terms of obligations, occupants are required to submit quarterly and annual reports to the development authority. To my knowledge, this has not started as yet. However, it should start this year. And it's important to start preparing for this obligation of submitting the report. And later on in the presentation, we'll speak more about this report. In addition to the reports, you have environmental, labor, safety, and health obligations. So just as if you were operating outside an SEZ, you would have those obligations. You also have the requirement to obtain a building permit or a fire permit, and just to maintain your occupant facilities. Now, when you apply for occupancy status, you would have told the authority perhaps that you're going to start a certain type of business within a year, or you're going to add on to the business or the, the infrastructure within six months, et cetera. And this is where commercial milestones and time schedules come into play. So you're required to meet that timeline. If you're not able to meet the timeline, then you're supposed to have a conversation with the authority to indicate. So for example, COVID happened, I'm not able to meet this timeline and you negotiate because what happens is these milestones and time schedules are in the application to the authority and they're also in the subconcession. So you're legally bound to adhere to those requirements. Now, developers and their obligations and rights. Developers are the main, I would say the main players, one of the major, the major player in an SEC. And so they have a number of obligations and rights. Essentially, the rights involve developing and managing and financing a zone, acquiring and maintaining occupancy rights for the SEZ land. So the developer would either own the land or be leasing the land from another party. In addition, the developer should have insurance, and this insurance should be for public liability, employment liability, and property insurance. Developers also to provide utilities and basic services because they have occupants and zone users, so they would need electricity, water, et cetera. The developer um, can receive compensation for any disruption of its operation or loss or damage, which result from willful or gross negligence or omissions com committed by a competent authority. When you look through the act or when you look through your subconcessionary license agreement, you also reference the competent authority. And the question always arises, who is the competent authority? Competent authority can be Jamaica Customs Agency, Tax Administration of Jamaica, or even NEPA. The final main right is the entitlement to fiscal incentives. Now, let's talk a little bit about the obligations of the developer. Developers to operate the zone on a fair and non discriminatory basis. What this means is that the developers, occupants, and zone users, and they all have rights, and the developer should ensure that each of them have equal access to the zone and to be able to develop their own business. Developers to demarcate the zone and ensure the zone is, fen is fenced as applicable because there might be zones that are not fenced, but you know this is the area that is the zone and the zone should be secured. The developer also has a responsibility to grant general access to the zone as is necessary to a competent authority. As we understand that there are some kinds of, of zones, particular BPOs that you have, you have to have a level of security and limited access. So this is as necessary. The developer should also provide suitable accommodation and amenities for the SEZ Authority and Jamaica Customs Agency. And this is because really the zones that we have now, they're intended to be even bigger than they, they currently are to the point where customs might need to come and stay at the zone for a day or a few hours to carry out some work or even the SEZ Authority to inspect the zone. 
In addition to the above, the developer is required to submit biannual reports. Similar to the occupant, the developer will submit this report to the authority, but the occupant will submit their report to the developer. The developer is also to adhere to performance requirements of the development schedule as outlined in their license agreement. So essentially, if you look, for example, at Portmore Holdings, um, that's a new construction. And when they would have started, they would have indicated that within a specific time, they're going to build the building and they're going to start operating. So this would be for in the person, in the company's license agreement to say within this timeline, you should have performed. And the, the authority will monitor you and inspect you to ensure that you're adhering to that timeline. And if you need help, they would provide the appropriate help. Developer is also to obtain prior approval of the SDG authority when transferring any occupancy rights or assets. So this is important. As a developer, normally you're carrying out your business and you might sell a piece of land or you might sell a elevator or some, something that you imported into the zone duty-free. It's important to understand that you need to communicate with the authority before doing that as for example, the elevator would have come in duty free and customs would have an interest in that elevator coming out of the zone. Or if you have the land and the land was designated as SEZ and you sell it to a third party, then you need to have a commu have communication with the authority about that. In addition to those other obligations, the developers to provide restaurants or other food service facilities. So again, this is where zone users can come in. The zone user would be the restaurant or the food service facility. Finally, the developer is to promote the SEZ in a coordination with the authority nationally and internationally. The reason for this is that SEZs can attract investment or in, are intended to attract investment from abroad. So if you're a developer and you have space and you need a new occupant, once the zone is promoted, then you can attract a new occupant, possibly a foreign investor from Japan, for example. So we've spoken about the different entities and it's important to, to now understand the application process. The application can be received from the Special Economic Zone Authority, but before you even apply, I think it's important to look at what is the eligibility criteria. So if you're a developer, as indicated before, you need to incorporate a company and it cannot be an overseas company. It would have to be a locally, local company. You would also need to have a sponsor. This sponsor would have to have issued and paid up share capital of the US 1.5 million. When submitting the application, you would have to show you have this issued and paid up share capital. And there are different ways of showing you have the issued and paid up share capital. It might be the company's office form nine, or it might be a report from a chartered financial accountant. After you determine whether or not you meet the eligibility criteria, then you determine which SEZ entity best suits your business plan and needs. So the developer has certain requirements for the occupant now, the requirements are to have issued and paid up share capital of US 25,000. And within the first year of developing, the occupant should have invested US 50,000 in equipment and machinery. So when you decide you want to join the SEG regime, you have to look at, do I have enough capital? Does it make sense for me to be a developer? If I'm going to be a developer, should I be a single entity or should I try to join a, a zone which currently exists? My advice would be to join a zone that currently exists as there are restrictions on single entity developers. And when the application goes towards to the board or even to the minister with responsibility for special economic zones, which is the prime minister, they will review the application and see, does this fit in with the SEZ policy? Does this fit in with the SEZ act? So other things to consider when you begin the process and you're consulting with the authority, you need to look for a location. Earlier, someone mentioned what will happen when there is work from home for BPOs. But in my view, what this creates is more space. So if there are persons working from home, then a zone will have space and this will create opportunities for businesses that want to do work in, for example, the creative industry or want to do pharmaceuticals. Other thing to consider is cost. Do I have the issue that I'm paid up share capital to be a developer? Do I have the issue that I'm paid up share capital to be an occupant? And when looking at a developer, it's also important to consider that a developer pays license fees. And these annual license fees are based on the the size of the zone. You have 20 cents for building and five cents per square foot for land space. The other thing to consider is what is the timeline for the entire process. The legislation has some timelines there, but 
you also need to ask the authority, all right? What is the process? How long does it take? Does it have to go to the board of the authority? Does it have to go to the minister? And in my view, it might take a shorter space of time if you want to be an occupant. Finally, particularly if you want to be a developer, you need to consult an attorney, engineer, and architect. Well, the engineer and architect, because you'd be building space and you'd have to have drawings, a master plan, et cetera. So suggestions when applying for SEZ status. And of course, this is just a summary. This is very brief. There are more things that you would consider. What I found in the past is um, once you know you're familiar with what is required by the authority, your application will have a smoother process. If you're not familiar, then you'll end up in a situation where you submit documents and then you have to submit a supplemental proposal and you might have to submit another supplemental proposal. So my first piece of advice is know the exact area which you wish to designate as a zone if you're applying to be a developer. What you found is that somebody might apply, to be, apply for say for example, 500 acres. But you don't want 500 acres because then you're going to pay building and, and land space of 20 cents and 5 cents and that's going to be very high and you would not be using all of that land so know exactly where you want to designate as a zone. In addition to that ensure the area is large enough to be considered economically viable and attractive for a zone. I say this because you might have a situation where literally you're applying for a shop to be a zone as a developer and that is not going to be attractive to the government of Jamaica. The other thing to consider is if you're a developer, review your technical description to ensure it doesn't have any inaccuracies, as we found in the past that there might be a number of errors in the technical description, and then you have to do over the technical description. So again, this is, is using time that you don't need to wait. If you have a large area, then what you can do is list the various um, properties and their volume and folio number, size, etc. And this will assist the authority when they get the application. The next thing to look at is to request information or templates for the business plan, safety and security plan and master plan. And these are just examples. So what you do when you request the template, you know what the authority is looking for. And you look at this in tandem with the act or regulations, which outlines the requirements for a business plan, for example. Next, you look at whether or not you meet the eligibility criteria. And we spoke about the eligibility criteria a little earlier. Finally, understand the application process. So earlier we spoke about timelines and steps. And it's important to hold the authority accountable. If they told you this is the steps, this is the timeline, then call them a week after and say, okay, where are we now? And you just follow through. Because the process can be, can be long, but it can be very re rewarding in my mind. So what happens after becoming an SEZ entity? Now you're a zone user, you're an occupant or a developer. What do you do? you'll get an operating certificate from the authority with the exception of a zone user. Only developers and, and occupants get operating certificates. Zone users get what we call an authorization letter. This operating certificate is reviewed on an annual basis and that is because of how the legislation is now. Dr. Deans would have to say if that will change in the future. You can have access to fiscal incentives, which we spoke about earlier. So for example, you have workers and they have a computer, they have a phone, then you can import those items without paying the customs duty. But the next thing to consider is that those items generally outside of work from home do not come out of the zone. You can also access non-fiscal incentives. So if you have something, for example, there's a company once that had to import, I think styrofoam to store fish and the government had new legislation regarding the use of styrofoam, so they needed help from Nepal as to how to apply for that exemption regarding the styrofoam material. The other thing to consider is if you're a developer, you'll have to pay license fees. However, if you're an occupant, you don't pay license fees. But to bear in mind, a developer can charge other fees, so you have to consider what works for you. Finally, um, you're monitored by the SEZ authority and you need to submit reports. No, I think it's important to consider what these reports entail. If you are a developer, you're required to submit reports biannually. If you're an occupant, then you're required to submit reports quarterly and on an annual basis. And these reports have specific requirements. So you're required to indicate how many employees you have, how, what are the activities that you've been involved in, how much, what has been your volume of exports, for example. So there's a section of the legislation that these are the requirements for reports, and I believe the authority has some information on its website about the reports. 
Now, to close off, what are the opportunities for investment? For the last about a year, we've had COVID and things have changed. Dr. Dees mentioned some upcoming zones such as Caymanoc, Pandora, and Xanadu. Panador being pharmaceuticals, Xanadu being in, being in a creative industry. So if you're involved, if you're interested in the SEs regime, I would suggest looking at what are the opportunities for telemedicine, pharmaceuticals, the creative industry, logistics and transshipment is currently big in Jamaica and it's poised to grow even further. He indicated that the authority is looking at rules of origin and rules of origin will deal with what happens in the event that you manufacture a good in an SEZ and want to export it to another CARICOM country or even to China? How would that good be treated? Will it, will it be treated of CARICOM origin? And what does the relevant trade agreement say? Other thing to consider is e-commerce and digital economy. Final, and the digital economy. Finally, things to consider are the COVID vaccine. I believe I read yesterday that a special economic zone in Colombia has actually built storage space for COVID vaccines. So essential of this is saying that there are various opportunities for business to grow. And these opportunities can be done through public private partnerships. So you can um, join with the government of Jamaica to build a zone. For example, we spoke about the Port Authority zones. In terms of financing, Melanie and Dr. Deans would have mentioned the IDV. There's also what you call a special economic zone fund. I don't believe it gives financing to SEZ entities, but you can look at how it can assist with research and development of zones and how that can assist your company as an SEZ entity. So that is it from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chantal. That was actually hugely informative. And I think that um, from some of the private messages I'm getting, people have learned a lot about, you know, some of the steps that are that are involved. Um, I have a, a quick question. I mean, um, here, let me put my video back on. Sorry, that's rude. Um, yeah, my question would be, what about, um, what about in, in terms of the legal structure, you know, we're on the first generation of SEZs. Mm -hmm. If I was to, or if, if, if someone was to sell you know, like there will be a point at which persons are, you know, looking to move around their property. You spoke about the technical description mm -hmm. and, you know, how is, uh, how does that work in the law right now? Also, and are there provisions right. for that in the future? All right, so to ensure I understand correctly, if you're an SEZ entity you now and you own land, and for example, maybe you want to sell the land or transfer it to another yeah, person. Owning the land or being, a, all right, so let's put it this way, a change of ownership right. for an occupant developer or zone user. So if you go in and you set up a, a canteen in a special economic zone, you did all the work and then you're like, oh, that's great. Now I'm going to sell it because I did all the work and I can put, now I've got this concession in, in a special economic zone and I'm servicing 3000 meals a day. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I guess it goes for all of the status. Yeah. Right. Okay, so to take them in turns, to start with a zone user, the zone user would have entered into authorization with the, with the authority slash developer. And that zone user might be the catering service that you mentioned, Melanie. They would need to indicate to the authority that they wish to terminate their status as a zone user. However, they want to transfer, transfer ownership, for example, to another company. And that company would apply to the special economic zone authority, rather the developer to become a zone user. But in another instance where you're an occupant or you are developer again it goes back to <laughs> we can hear you no okay sorry all right great um it goes back to your agreement so for the occupant you'd have to look at the subconcession agreement and you'd have to look at the sez act and regulations the sez act and regulations has a section on transfer of assets or transfer of, of land it's important to speak with the authority and ensure that for example, if you transfer an asset, they would have come through without paying duty. So tax and customs are going to be interested in that. You would just outline, this is what I want to do, get the relevant consent from the authority or the developer, and they would outline what are the requirements for that transaction. Granted, this is something very novel 
So I think it's a learning experience for both the client and the authority. If you're a developer now and you want to do a, a change of ownership, again, you write to the authority, indicate this is the company that will be the new sponsor for the developer. Um, the authority will do the relevant due diligence to ensure that you know the company is sound, has the relevant capital, et cetera. And then at some point, of course, there would be private things between the developer, between the sponsor, between the current owner and the new owner, they'd have to come to some agreement. And then after some time, there would be a change of ownership. And that, and that would be it. So it's not impossible. I think it's just important to check the agreement with the authority or the occupant or the developer, sorry, and also to check the legislation. I think you're unmuted now, Melanie? Yeah, I yeah. am. Great. Um, so then another question is if there's any exemption from the share capital requirement of 1.5 million US. I've asked this question once or twice already myself um, and I was told no, but um, uh, maybe you can take that. And then afterwards, and I'll just put myself back on mute. Um, the next question I would want to ask is, what are the legal agreements? Because there's not just the legal application of the legal agreement between the SEZ and each of the use, each of the people, but there is a sub-concession agreement as right. well, um, which I think needs to be considered. So there are legal fees here. So since you're a lawyer, maybe you could go over that. <laughs> All right. So um, I was looking at the question. Generally, there's no exemption. The, the 1.5 million applies to the developer. And there is no exemption to that. However, I see a question here about SME, SMEs and whether they're not they're exempted. Now, if you're an SME, SME, sorry, applying as an occupant, the issued and paid up share capital that's generally applicable to you would be the 25,000. However, how the legislation is set up is that it says if you don't meet the eligibility criteria, however, you show um development potential i don't want to use the, the wrong word but it refers to development potential and that you can um within the first year you can do an investment of i believe twenty five thousand in equipment etc then the issued and paid up share capital wouldn't apply to you so let me start over so for SME, smes the 1.5 million is not applicable if you're applying to be an sme occupant and um dr deans is new to what he can come in and assist here no you plan to be an occupant, the general requirement would be the, um, I know there's, I'm saying so many figures, it's gone over my head. The general requirement would be the US 25,000 issued and paid up share capital. But if you show development potential, then you can be deemed as eligible to become an occupant without having to meet the issued and paid up share capital requirements. So I hope that helps. Melanie, I think you had a second question about the legal agreement. So the developer enters into what you call a, either a license agreement or a master concession agreement with the authority, depending on who owns the land. If the land is vested in the government, then it would be a master concession agreement. But generally, let's just stick to license agreement and, and keep it very simple. The occupant now enters into what you call a sub concession agreement with the developer. And then the zone user just has an authorization letter. So within those agreements, you have obligations and rights. And it goes through what Melanie brought up earlier about how you transfer land, how if there's a change of ownership, how you deal with force majeure. So for example, COVID-19 would have had some impact on some occupants or developers. What happens if you have to terminate? What happens if you have to stop operating for a period of time? Different things like that it deals with. I hope that answers the question. You can tell me if you want. Yeah, to. no, that answers the question. And there, there is a warranty as well that needs to be that needs to be dealt with as right. well. Would, right. would you like to cover that quickly? What, which one of the warranties? The warranty oh, by the developer or for any of the other users? Right. Actually, I don't remember the full section on warranties right now um, in the agreement, but essentially whatever you would have agreed to in terms of um, commercial milestones, then you're indicating you would meet those timelines and you would build um, a building if it is that you're going to build a building or two buildings, etc. But I can um, expound on that a little bit more. And, and, the, the, and any guarantees as well. I think that that's important. That right. People, there may be a guarantee required. Right. I, we have guarantee and warranties, which we could talk about a little bit more. Um, um, 
everything is on MSMEs. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think we've answered all the questions that are in there. If anyone wants to type anything else on the, on the chat. I see um, somebody says, what if you are an MSME and you want to apply as a developer, does the 1.5 million apply? I think we answered that, right? The one. Yeah. But I'm not sure why you would want to be a developer as an SME, SME, SME. I always have trouble pronouncing that word. Um, perhaps Ms. Cook Johnson could expand on that a little bit more. I see Ainsley uh, adding Ainsley from the authority that an SME occupant must prove the US 25,000 or they can be given an exemption from the US 50,000 up to four years. All of this applies to new businesses and not existing business. So essentially he's making the point. Occupants are for, um, all right. So the point is that um, to become a developer and an occupant at this time, you cannot be an existing business in Jamaica. You can't, meaning you cannot be, for example, you cannot be operating in Jamaica. And that's because they have what you call a zone establishment period for 10 years. However, if you're an existing business such as KFC or creative building finishes, you can apply to be a zone user at this time. Now, to, to explain a little on what Ainsley is saying, you want to apply to be an SME occupant, you have to, Ainsley, you say you have to prove the US 25,000, 25,000 in relation to what you're speaking about, Ainsley, if you could just add there, because from going back there, Andrea, can you unmute Ainsley or Dr. Deans just to deal with, with this one? Or Dr. Alana said she's a, she's a little clearer. So the first schedule of the, the fourth schedule of the SEV Act, I don't think Ainsley is on, is he on mute it, deals with the, the requirements. And if you look at, the fourth schedule, paragraph one, it speaks to SME. So it says if they don't meet the relevant criteria in paragraph one, which is the issue that paid up share capital, the authority may issue a written approval to the company to establish, self, establish itself in a zone as an occupant in the event that in, in the opinion of the authority, so you see it goes back to the authority and their discretion, the SME, MSME has sufficient development potential as shown in their business plan um, to so warrant. However, the company must be limited by shares registered under the Companies Act and have a subconcession with an agreement and the investment to which paragraph one e, e relate shall not be less than 25,000. So the 25,000 would be the investment within the year in assets such as machinery and equipment. And we could speak a little bit about that some more. This is Lord, oh, uh, Ms. Patterson Walters from Attorney General have a question. Okay. Oh, 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 that was to me. All right, that's Pete Sarah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so, oh, yeah. so um, I think when we get into these very detailed questions, it's just a sign that um, you gave an excellent presentation because otherwise the questions would be more general. Right. So I'd like to thank you very much for, um, for your presentation. Um, you. And at, you did an excellent job and clarified. And just, you know, to summarize from what I've learned from this, there are three categories of application to make, developer, occupant, um, and zone user, that there are fiscal incentives available to two of them, that there are, a, that, um, there are exemptions of what can take place in the special economic zone. So some areas are exempted and that there is an excellent website that is new and the application process is on there with, um, with a lot of information. Um, and I think both parties are encouraging you to reach out to the, each of their organizations in order to seek clarity if you would need it. Um, I think one of the other things that I was pleased about was to see you know, this discussion on work from home and um, the, you know, the issue in relation to tax on digital devices. And I think that that's a debate that hopefully we can all continue to have so that we all get, um, you know, to discuss this and, and look at the ease of doing business here and also 
um, making sure that um, we are supporting the growth that has already occurred. And um, the fact that we're talking about this during COVID and Dr. Dean's slide highlighted that 65,000 people are employed in free zones. And we currently have, um, you know, a, a limit to the amount of employment in tourism due to the epidemic. I think it's really a key time to be supporting this area and looking at opportunities to grow um, and to support the tourism industry as well, because these, these are so important. Um, and so in closing, I'd like to encourage anyone to reach out to the chamber. I believe that the presentations are available from the chamber. So give the chamber a call and they can email you the presentation. And also you can um, get an application form from the Jamaica Chamber of Commerce and feel free to, to join. Um, and we're, we're trying to encourage new members um, and we would love your feedback on this event and any potential events you would like to hear about in the future. So again, thank you very much to Dr. Dean. Thank you, Chantal Bennett. Um, and thank you everyone for attending and all the amazing questions. Um, and I guess the way it works is we just terminate and leave. So it's kind of, <laughs> thank you very much. Sorry, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Melanie. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Chantal. Thank you, Dr. Dean. Thank you. Great You're job. Welcome. Thanks.